Hey, everybody. It is Thursday, April 25th. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mo Shwanunu. This is the place where we always bring you just the facts and read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. It's another solo show with me today as Jill has the week off. Looking at the list of holidays today, it is National Hug a Plumber Day. Yes, that exists. So if there's a plumber in your life and you appreciate them, give them a hug. And with that, let's get started with today's headlines. We'll have the latest for you from the protests rocking campuses across America and now around the world as some institutions are shutting down the anti-Israel demonstrations. And the U.S. Speaker of the House made his way to Columbia yesterday to call for the resignation of the university president. The White House yesterday announced some new rules for U.S. airliners. It'll require them to give us cash refunds instead of vouchers. And there are some new rules when it comes to delays. All in all, some good news for consumers. TikTok vowing to fight back after Biden signed the law yesterday, giving them one year to be sold to a non-Chinese company or face a ban here in America. We have a bunch of Supreme Court news for you today, including a key abortion case they heard yesterday. Today, they'll be taking up Trump's claim that he has immunity for life after being president. We'll also tell you about the state of Arizona overturning that abortion ban from the 1860s. An interesting story from Afghanistan, how the Taliban is using influencers to try to paint a rosy image of their authoritarian regime. And as we mark Infertility Awareness Week this week, one woman who single-handedly is using her own body to help a dozen families with infertility issues. And of course, I'll end as always with On This Day in History. But let's get started here with the latest on American college campuses. Police tangling with student demonstrators in Texas and California yesterday as new tent encampments sprouted up across the country at Harvard, uh, on the East Coast, in the Midwest, and on the West Coast. Down at the University of Texas at Austin, dozens of local police and state troopers formed a line to prevent students from marching through campus, eventually clashing with the protesters, detaining multiple people, arresting several others. The campus there saying they will not tolerate distractions and unpermitted assemblies at a time when final exams are happening. Uh, The images were pretty stark from Austin, Texas State Police, some on horseback, some holding batons, creating a perimeter around the school's main lawn. As protesters tried to assemble, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, announcing that anti-Semitism will not be tolerated in Texas, period. He says students joining hate-filled anti-Semitic protests at any public college or university in Texas should be expelled. Over in California yesterday at the University of Southern California, USC, police attempted to remove several tents, got into a back and forth tugging match with protesters over the tents. They ended up detaining at least one student. Uh, Then protesters surrounded the police car uh, for nearly an hour, calling for the police to release that student. Eventually, the police would release him unable to move the police car uh, surrounded by the protesters. On the East Coast at Harvard University yesterday, where they were trying to limit access to Harvard Yard, uh, which typically requires permission for tents and tables, well, the protesters don't seem to care, and they set up camp with at least a dozen tents on Wednesday. This all comes as the pro-Palestinian anti-Israel demonstrators are demanding uh, in many cases that their schools cut all ties with Israel, including divest from companies that work with the Israeli government. We're talking about companies like Amazon and Google and Apple. Several hundred students have now been arrested at campuses across the country. And while some of these students say that they're just here to peacefully assemble, some of the rhetoric uh, and actions have gotten violent, leading to some Jewish students saying they no longer feel safe on their college campuses. Much of this got started at Columbia University in New York City, where the administration there is continuing to negotiate with students uh, who have set up a now second tent encampment after they brought in police to take apart the tent encampment last week. Protesters have returned to the campus, and that has really inspired now dozens of these protests happening across the country. A protest also sprouted up yesterday in Paris, France, as well as Sydney, Australia. Colombia has become a mecca of sorts uh, for uh, visitors. Yesterday, the U.S. Speaker of the House, Republican Mike Johnson, along with several other members of Congress, met with the Columbia University president, Manu Shafiq, Following that meeting, they held a press conference, uh, very raucous, a lot of interruptions, protesters yelling at the Speaker of the House and members of Congress uh, as Johnson and the group called on Shafiq to resign if she cannot bring order to the chaos on campus. Johnson saying he will speak with President Biden about sending in the National Guard if the campus or the state of New York, uh, none of whom tried to address the situation. Johnson was booed and heckled uh, with chants of Mike, you suck, among other choice phrases for nearly the 20 minutes that they spoke yesterday. Johnson telling the protesters, it does not matter who shouts in our faces. We're going to do what's right by America. 
Johnson also adding, we respect free speech, we respect diversity of ideas, but there is a way to do that in a lawful manner. And that's not what this is, uh, referring to the fact that the uh, protesters here on Columbia's campus, as well as several other of these campuses, are breaking school rules, which require permits, and there's specific areas uh, to assemble and hold protests. Among the demands of these protesters, as I mentioned, they're calling on the universities to stop investing in companies that work with Israel. They're also calling on uh, their campuses to stop study abroad programs in the country. Though uh, there have been a couple interviews with some of these protesters who say they don't exactly know what they're doing there, some more informed than others when it comes to the situation on their campuses. Notably, as I mentioned, the protests spreading a bit abroad, they're also getting attention from uh, some leaders in the Middle East. That includes the Israeli prime minister who spoke out yesterday calling the uh, situation on America's college campuses, quote, horrific. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying that anti-Semitic mobs have taken over leading universities, calling for the annihilation of Israel, attacking Jewish students, attacking Jewish faculty. This is reminiscent of what happened at German universities in the 1930s. Notably, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, was educated in the U.S., receiving a degree from MIT, uh, as well as studying at Harvard. Also noticing these protests, the Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran, the fundamentalist authoritarian religious leader of Iran, posting on Twitter yesterday a photo of one of the protests in New York City, protesters in one case holding a flag of Hezbollah. This is the terrorist group that Iran funds in arms in Lebanon, the Ayatollah touting on Twitter that it shows that the people of the world are supporting Iran and the groups it supports in their goal of destroying Israel. Uh, again, this appears to have been a protest in New York in the last several weeks where someone was waving a Hezbollah flag. Uh, we've also seen videos of chants from Columbia University where people say things like, we are all Hamas. Now, some of the protesters say they're frustrated, saying their message is being taken over by some extremists, though at the same time, we haven't seen much in the way of condemnation from a number of these student protesters. Many are asked in multiple interviews if they condemn Hamas at all, nearly all of them refusing to condemn Hamas, signs of all resistance is justified. Uh, there was also a video uh, in recent days from Colombia of uh, one of the protesters shouting that October 7th needs to happen 10,000 more times. So we're going to continue to watch the escalating situation on college campuses as the universities here appear to be struggling between uh, dealing with these uh, small but very vocal protest movements, which would involve their students, but also outsiders that appear to be instigating things further. And at the same time, government leaders, uh, Jewish students, organizations, uh, etc., who say that things have gotten out of control and it's uh, created a very unsafe environment on a number of campuses sort of reminds me of the situation with the Black Lives Matter protests back in 2020, which began initially uh, with protests and marches, uh, then of course devolved into looting in some cases, a uh, call to defund the police. It seems at times, you know, these various protest movements, and you go back decades around the world, uh, the message sometimes gets diluted. And with all these disparate groups, you're hearing a variety of messages, but in particular, you're hearing on these college campuses, uh, more and more extreme rhetoric calls for the end to Israel uh, and an end to all of their university's relationships with the country. Again, leading to concerns about safety for Jewish students and concerns about anti-Semitic rhetoric. All right, so we'll keep monitoring that, but switching gears here, we're gonna head to Washington where the Biden administration is engaged in a new effort to crack down on airlines that charge passengers steep fees to check bags and change flights. The US Department of Transportation announcing on Wednesday new regulations to expand consumer protections, protect us, and ensure we're getting refunds. So two big rules announced yesterday. One requires airlines to show the full price of travel before passengers pay for their tickets. So this is as you're booking online, you might see a price, but then suddenly it goes up with baggage costs, with potential change fees, cancellation fees, other fees get added on, and then ultimately you see a much higher cost. Well, this new rule is going to require airlines to put the full price up there up front so you don't see it gradually tick up as you click through the pages. And then there's the second rule. This one is going to force all airlines here in the U.S. to provide prompt cash refunds when flights are canceled or significantly changed. Uh, right now, as many of you know, you have to put in a request. You have to submit a paper trail. Uh, every airline has different rules. Sometimes it requires waiting hours on the phone. And sometimes ultimately you're just given airline credit or vouchers. Well, there is now a new rule that requires airlines to, again, give prompt cash refunds without all of that bureaucratic mess and red tape. 
Until now, airlines have been allowed to set their own definition of what is, quote unquote, a significant delay. Compensation is different for every airline. So the Transportation Department now stepping in here. Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg says there will now be one standard when departure or arrival is delayed by three hours for domestic flights or six hours for international flights. You are entitled to a full cash refund. And there's a list of significant new changes here. These will be implemented over the next two years. So be on the lookout of when you can get money back. That includes the departure or arrival from an airport is different from the one booked, like they fly you to a new airport. Connections are taken through different airports. Flights on various planes are not accessible to a person with a disability. Uh, There's an increase in the number of scheduled connections. Also, they say uh, you're entitled to a refund now if if services like Wi-Fi doesn't work or seat selection becomes unavailable to you. Buddha Judge, the Transportation Secretary, saying again, passengers deserve to know upfront what costs they're facing and get their money back when an airline owes them without having to ask. Now, the airline industry not happy with these new rules. At a hearing on this last year, a lobbying group that represents American Airlines, Delta, and United said it's going to be too difficult for airlines to disclose all their charges clearly here. They warn that this will cause confusion and frustration and is going to be a huge headache for them. The Transportation Department insisting to the airlines, we think you can do this. And this is something consumers deserve. This is just the latest move here by the Transportation Department to get rid of what's called junk fees. Much more transparency here. The hope from the Biden administration is that this helps consumers. And it also happens to be an election year. And their hope is that people remember this when they vote in November. All right, we have a lot more coming up in today's podcast. But first, a word from one of our longtime partners here. I've told you for a while now that I've been using AG1 powder every morning as a way to get all of my nutrients in one easy and quick way. Just takes a few seconds, a scoop of AG1 powder in a glass of water, and you're replacing multiple health supplements like multivitamins, digestive aids, immune support with just, again, that one simple scoop. You're getting things like vitamin C and zinc for immune health. You're getting magnesium, ashwagandha for stress support. So you're covering all your nutritional bases in just a few seconds. And what's great is AG1 is offering all of you in the Mo News community a special deal. Right now, giving Mo News listeners a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs of AG1. You can check it all out over at drinkag1.com slash Mo News. That is drinkag, the number one, dot com slash Mo News. That's where you can get a discounted monthly subscription or try it just one time for one month. Again, drinkag, the number one, dot com slash monus to take ownership of your health. All right, let's get to today's speed read now. We begin with this from CNBC. TikTok is vowing not to go down without a fight. The TikTok CEO, Sho Chu, saying Wednesday in a TikTok video, where else would he post it, that the company is going to go to court and attempt to remain online in the US. Chu said in a video, quote, rest assured, we're not going anywhere. TikTok denouncing the potential ban signed into law by President Biden. Remember, this is the piece of legislation that requires TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, which is based in China, to sell TikTok within the year or face a ban here in the U.S. The CEO of TikTok saying that they believe they will prevail in court. They believe they have the Constitution on our side. For TikTok, it's a First Amendment argument. They believe that this takes away the First Amendment rights of the nearly 170 million Americans who use TikTok. That's about 50% of this country. For the government, it's a national security argument saying that the U.S. cannot afford to have a foreign adversary control such an influential app. Again, the government saying here, this is not a ban on TikTok. They're just calling for it to be sold by its parent company, ByteDance, to a non-Chinese owner. The concern from the U.S. government is that China can infiltrate the app, get user information, uh, and also push propaganda to Americans. Uh, The uh, comparison being made here that imagine the Soviet Union during the 50 years of the Cold War uh, had control of an influential app inside the country. Uh, That's the concern when you talk to the folks at the FBI, CIA, and various uh, parts of the government. You saw an overwhelming vote in the House, Senate, President Biden signed this. Uh, One major person who's opposed to this former President Trump. So if he's reelected in November, uh, there are questions as to whether this ban will go through. But with TikTok here promising a fight, as we heard from the CEO yesterday, it could be years in court before we finally see this uh, resolved. So while we sit here in the year 2024, it could be until into 2026, two years from now, when we finally uh, hear the last word, it could be the Supreme Court on whether this law is legal. 
All right, next up from the Washington Post, a couple key abortion stories we're watching. First, in Washington, a very divided Supreme Court seems skeptical Wednesday that federal law can require hospitals to provide emergency abortion care in states that have bans. So this is now the latest legal battle over abortion uh, with the federal government fighting states that have banned the procedure. The case here is called Moyle versus the United States, and it focuses on the state of Idaho's abortion ban. Now, the ban in Idaho says that anyone who performs an abortion is subject to criminal penalties. But there is a federal law that provides an exception for abortions when it is necessary to protect the life of a pregnant woman. The Biden administration sued the state of Idaho, arguing that federal law requires hospitals to provide appropriate emergency room care, which could include abortions. The Biden administration invoking what's called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, the EMTALA, to try to regain emergency access to abortions in Idaho. Uh, The law in Idaho imposes penalties of up to five years in prison on doctors who perform the procedure, with an exception when, quote, necessary to prevent the death of a pregnant woman. The issue here is when is that necessary? How long can hospitals make women wait? Uh, And the fact that that state law leads to concern among doctors about when to intervene, uh, when they've determined that actually death might be imminent. So the Biden administration here arguing that that standard is dangerous for women. And throughout the two hours of argument, uh, it seems as though the majority of the conservatives are leaning with the state of Idaho here, saying that federal law does not override the state abortion ban. The court's three liberal justices, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Ketanji Jackson, all appearing to agree with the feds in this case. The conservative justices, meanwhile, who make up the majority of the court as a 6-3 conservative majority, pushed back on the Biden interpretation of the federal law, suggesting that the federal government cannot force private hospitals that receive federal funds to violate a state law. So again, the state saying uh, abortion ban, the Fed saying you got to make exceptions for emergency care. It will be interesting to watch in this case as we await a decision in late June, early July. That's when they typically put out their biggest decisions where Justice Amy Coney Barrett and Justice John Roberts land, both conservatives, but both appeared to pose tough questions to both sides, Amy Coney Barrett being the alone conservative female justice, whether um, the two of them might side with the liberals here is something to watch. So we'll keep tabs on that in the coming weeks. Uh, Sticking with the issue of abortion here, we're watching the situation unfold in Arizona. We told you about how the uh, state Supreme Court there recently allowed the ban on abortion from 1864, 160 years ago, to be re-implemented in the state because it never came off the books. Well, Arizona yesterday taking a major step towards scrapping that abortion ban from 1864. Republicans have the majority in the state legislatures, and they voted yesterday in the Arizona House to repeal the ban from 1864. This came a couple weeks after they refused to do so. It appears the pressure is on them to uh, pull back on this very strict abortion ban. And now the state Senate will take it up where they uh, look like they might have the votes to repeal. A reminder, the uh, governor in Arizona is a Democrat, Katie Hobbs. She's been urging lawmakers to act here. As a backup here, uh, Arizona does have a 15-week abortion ban, but this is a complete ban from 1864. It appeals as being repealed now. Among those who've been pushing for the repeal here, including some national Republicans who say this has gone too far, including former President Trump, who says this is really bad for Republican politics, and he felt this complete ban was a bad idea. So now you have Arizona pushing back here. Interestingly, Arizona is one of the states where voters will have a ballot measure on abortion uh, this November. And that's not yet finalized, but it's looking very likely Arizona, one of nearly a dozen states where voters will be able to have their say on abortion. Uh, as we've noted here in the last couple of years, since the overturn of Roe v. Wade, a number of states have voted on abortion. And when it's gone to the ballot to all voters, red states and blue states have all voted so far unanimously to uh, keep abortion rights. So that's another a story we'll be watching this November. One more item here in the speed read from The Hill. We'll stay with the Supreme Court here. They have a big case today when it comes to presidential immunity. It's an unprecedented and historic case with significant implications for former President Trump, his legal fights, and this year's presidential race. So the Supreme Court today focused on presidential immunity. Trump has been pushing the argument that's already been rejected by two lower courts that he, as a former president, remains immune from prosecution for the rest of his life. Now, those opposed to this, and they've won in the lower court so far, say that while presidents have immunity while in office, they do not have immunity for life, and it would create a bad precedent to allow presidents to never have to face any sort of repercussions, criminal repercussions, for any crimes they commit while they were in office or after office. 
Now, notably, on the Supreme Court, it is a 6-3 conservative majority. Three of those conservative justices were appointed by Trump to the court, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, who I mentioned earlier. None of them have recused themselves from this case. It will be interesting to hear the arguments on that today. And it's going to be the first time justices on the court are considering an appeal from one of Trump's four criminal indictments. Their decision here could dictate whether or not two of his federal cases ever reach a jury. Remember, he's facing federal cases when it comes to those classified documents, as well as January 6th. The special counsel, Jack Smith, has argued that presidents, like any other citizen, must be held to account if they commit crimes. They do not have immunity for life. Trump has argued he needs immunity for life. It will have a chilling effect on all presidential power. So uh, these arguments will go down later this morning in Washington. All right, one interesting story I noticed from abroad, from the Washington Post, the Taliban-run government in Afghanistan is fostering a community of YouTube influencers and video bloggers in the country trying to push a positive narrative about the Taliban. Now, you might recall that the Taliban, which led Afghanistan back in the 1990s until just after 9-11 and then returned to power two years ago, once smashed TVs, burned films, uh, hated all modern technology during their first time running Afghanistan. Well, this time they're sort of embracing modern video technology as part of their radical campaign to remake Afghanistan and try to put forth a positive image of the country. So the Washington Post reports here that the Taliban is granting influencers broadcasting licenses and putting them on equal footing with TV networks and radio stations in the country, trying to put forth an image on YouTube of a gentler Taliban, a positive image um, of the country where the majority of the population is suffering from malnutrition uh, and women have had most of their rights taken away. The secondary schools have been closed. Women have been banned from attending university, working in a number of jobs. Women are restricted from traveling without a male chaperone. They're banned from public spaces like parks and gyms. And again, banned from almost all jobs in the country. And yet the Taliban here are using male influencers on YouTube to showcase a successful Afghanistan, or at least attempting to. Now, internet speeds and mobile data are pretty limited in Afghanistan, so the audience here is primarily abroad. They're trying to target specifically Afghans abroad to show that the Taliban ain't so bad. So if you've noticed a positive video of the Taliban uh, on YouTube, well, it might be due to the fact they're paying these influencers to put forth a positive image. Uh, YouTube, of course, is owned by Google. They were asked about this. Google saying that they uh, are trying to take down as many videos as they can if they find that they are linked to the Taliban and that Google will follow all trade compliance and sanctions laws, including U.S. sanctions on the Taliban. So if they find out an account is linked to the Taliban, they terminate it. And finally here from the Today Show, Today.com has been bringing a number of compelling stories around National Infertility Awareness Week this week. And this is one remarkable one out of Ohio. In the last 13 years, 37-year-old Emily Westerfield has delivered 10 healthy babies. Three of the 10 babies, her own biological children, seven of them as a surrogate for several families. Two times, she carried twins. And now Emily Westerfield, pregnant for the 11th time. She's 28 weeks pregnant and due later this summer. So this all goes back to 2010. Westerfield and her husband, Max, living in Ohio with their three biological children. She was spending a lot of time bonding with her husband's cousin, who was having a number of infertility issues. She was able to conceive and deliver her children with ease. And so without knowing much about the process of surrogacy, she offered to be a gestational carrier for the cousin's embryo. And she says, when she gave birth the first time, she said, I want to do this again. It was almost like, she says, now who else can I help? So since then, she has now delivered healthy babies in 2011, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2017, 2018, 2021, 2022. And as I mentioned, she's currently pregnant and due in July. Her incredible success in navigating her own surrogacy experience has now led her to give birth to Caring Dreams. It's her own full service agency designed to help egg donors, surrogates, and intended parents on the parenting journeys in a way that best works for them, as she says. She also helps match families with gestational carriers and helps hold their hand through a uh, very challenging process, making sure they're all on the same page when it comes to very important topics physical and chromosomal abnormalities, geographic location, contact preferences after birth for the uh, surrogate mom, as well as uh, things like vaccination status. You can watch more of this story over at today.com as they mark a a very important topic. Uh, Again, it's National Infertility Awareness Week. 
All right, we end here as we typically do with On This Day in History. We begin in 1859. On this day, construction of the Suez Canal began. It took about 10 years. The waterway would connect the Mediterranean and Red Seas, cutting down on shipping times for boats traveling from Asia to the Americas to Europe, uh, cutting the typical time to go around Africa. Obviously, uh, in recent months with the uh, Houthis targeting shipping in the Red Sea, that has uh, really cut down on the amount of traffic through the Suez Canal. All right, we now head to 1901 on this day in history. New York became the first state to mandate license plates for these new things called automobiles and motorcycles. This was an attempt for law enforcement to get a better understanding of who was driving what vehicle at the time. All license plates had the owner's initials on them. All right, on this day in 1945, 12 days after President Franklin Roosevelt died, the new president, Harry Truman, learned for the first time about the Manhattan Project. This, of course, was the project developing the first atomic bomb uh, back on April 12th, just after his inauguration for his fourth term as president. FDR dies. He has a brand new vice president. He had four different vice presidents. Harry Truman was not briefed on this, though he's sworn in and informed on that day, listen, Harry, there's a new and terrible weapon we're developing in New Mexico. They did not give him the details until nearly about two weeks later when he learned about the Manhattan Project and then would have to decide how to use it or if to use it. Of course, four months later, the U.S. would drop two atomic bombs on Japan. At the time, Harry Truman worried that a full invasion of Japan could lead to a war lasting another year and the deaths of more than a million more people, including hundreds of thousands of additional Americans. If you've watched the movie Oppenheimer, uh, they get into a bit of this history. All right, sticking with Harry Truman here. Some lighter news when it comes to President Truman on this day in 1947. He officially opened the White House bowling alley. This is a two-lane bowling alley in the West Wing. And if you know anyone who works for the president, uh, they typically rotate this around and give access to guests. All right, a bit of pop culture news before we go here. On this day in 1992, a number of the biggest shows from the 1980s, MacGyver, Who's the Boss, and Growing Pains, all aired their series finales tonight in 1992. All right, we end with music history here on this day 54 years ago. The Jackson 5 reaching number one on the Billboard charts with ABC. And finally, 26 years ago today, the group Next, they're reaching number one on the Billboard charts with Too Close, one of those uh, club hits from the late 90s. All right. Thanks for joining us again for the Mo News Daily Podcast. Appreciate you guys rolling with me solo this week. Jill will be back next week, but we got one more solo edition for you tomorrow. So stick around. And of course, for News 24-7, follow us over on Instagram. And if you don't already subscribe to the Mo Newsletter, sometimes we cover things we cover in the pod. Sometimes we don't. Today, we have a couple fresh stories for you that you did not get in today's podcast. So check that out over at mo.news slash newsletter. See you guys tomorrow. Thanks for listening to the Mo News Podcast.